you to open your Bibles to Galatians. <clears throat> going back to Galatians 3, I'm going to do something just a little different this evening. I did this occasionally with Matthew, and I, I think it important and instructive uh, for us to learn to think what's behind the words that we hear in Scripture. Very often, for many of us, they're just like something floating in the air. They're just on the page, and we don't think of how it connects to the, the chapters before it, the chapters after it, the, the books before it, the testaments before or after it. <clears throat> this Bible interprets itself and we need to be able to think more carefully about how it does that and what is behind the words <clears throat> i know each of you probably have some experience in talking to people and you hear them say things and as you ponder what they've said you think hmm i wonder what was behind that i wonder what was driving what they said. Well, we want to see what's driving Paul a little bit. And I hope this will be instructive for us. We'll be reading a lot of scripture this evening, but I trust that you will find that helpful and uh, a connecting of the dots that's important for us. So Galatians chapter 3, we're actually going to read from verse 5 through verse 18. I will be focusing on verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> so if you'll stand with me, we'll read it. Galatians. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, brethren, this is God's word. These are truly the living words of Almighty God. This is his authority in action. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He's not asking for information. He's grasping their consciences. They know the answer. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is the doctrine of justification by faith. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. <clears throat> and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. To show you the importance of the word, it says the scripture foreseeing preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Go back and read Genesis. It was God speaking directly. It identifies God and the scriptures. It is his word. In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Don't miss this. 
the promise and the blessing of Abraham includes the Holy Spirit. For if we're without the Holy Spirit, we are not in the blessing of, of Abraham. <clears throat> Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. My Father in heaven, now please wash over thy people Flood them, fill them, immerse them with thy spirit. Bless and encourage. Send out thy light and thy truth and make us to know the living realities of our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I want to begin this evening with the biblical and covenantal introduction to Paul's argument. Before the world began, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit purposed to save an innumerable host of sinners, make them like Jesus Christ, and establish a kingdom of kings and priests that will never end. A kingdom of peace, a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of infinite glory and of heavenly beauty. The eternal son agreed to become a man, to keep the laws that sinners would break, to die a bloody death as their sin-bearing substitute, to rise again the third day conquering death and hell, to ascend into glory as their intercessor until the moment he returns to judge the world and to consummate his everlasting kingdom in dazzling splendor. Majesty. This holy purpose of redemption would unfold throughout human history as God progressively revealed himself and his plan by entering into covenant relationships with sinful human beings. Do you understand the Bible that way? If not, let me urge you to study anew. Adam and Eve broke the first covenant, and God drove them out of their garden temple. But before driving them out, he announced to the lying serpent in the presence of the sinful couple, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The long historical journey to the human appearing of the woman's seed progressively emerged from that moment. In other words, if you're thinking biblically, you will realize that Genesis 3.15 is the open revelation and declaration of the coming Christ and the outflowing of human history. Everything in the Bible flows from that moment. Everything. Everything. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan heard his conqueror announced. And that set up a conflict. Seed of the woman, 
seed of the serpent. That conflict between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed becomes the central conflict of the Bible. It is the central conflict in human history. Now, I, I ask us all again. Do you understand the Bible that way? Do you understand that from that moment, all the sorrow, all the sadness, all the heartache, all the tears, all the death and dying, it's because of that broken covenant. And there was the promise of a conqueror. The promise of a conqueror that would crush the serpent's head. That battle has been going on since that moment. God would later covenant with Noah, his sons, and creation, building upon that promise. And then he would take a sinful man named Abram out of an idolatrous culture and give him a promise and a covenant that would change the world. Later, God would covenant with Moses and the Abrahamic nation of Israel. Never forget, Israel is part of the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12. More about that as we go along. So, how do the two covenants, Abraham and Moses, relate to each other? That is the subject of Paul's argument in our text. And very often, we read what the text says, but we don't stop and think, what was going on in Paul's mind? Let's remember, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. If anybody knew the Jewish scriptures, it was Paul. He's not just spinning something that's disconnected from his roots. He's not spinning something that's disconnected from the Holy Old Testament scriptures from which he preached. So we want to take a little time looking back behind what Paul says in verse 16 and 17 this evening. The sermon is entitled, Abraham and Moses. So may our gracious Heavenly Father magnify His love and His grace in Christ Jesus in our souls. May it expand our understanding of Scripture. May it give us a greater appreciation for what God has done. And may the Holy Spirit fill our hearts with the understanding of Paul's inspired letter to the Galatians. <clears throat> well, our first major thought this evening is that Paul argues that Moses did not supersede Abraham. We talked about that in uh, the last time we were in Galatians. We want to get behind that a little bit more this evening. Beginning in verse 17, what we see in the sacred text is, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, <coughs> which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. <coughs> <coughs> Paul has argued that the Old Testament teaches justification by faith. We have seen that. Justification never has been by works. It has been by faith. Likewise, receiving the Holy Spirit comes by the hearing of faith. Believing the words being spoken to you. It's not by the works of the law, because no one is able to keep the law perfectly. And to fail to do so brings the law's curse. 
And as the apostle continues to defend the gospel from Judaizers, he wisely argues from the Old Testament scriptures. As a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as I have already said, Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures well, but now he understands them in the light of Christ. He understands something about Christ and the Old Testament that he never saw as a lost man. The Old Testament scriptures, I remind you, were the Bible of the early churches. They didn't walk down to the uh, local Christian bookstore. There was no such thing. They couldn't find a nice leather-bound Bible. There was no such thing. <clears throat> they didn't even have a New Testament. It was being written. The apostolic letters were being distributed among the churches. But they didn't have something that's nice wasn't there. They had to listen. They had to pay attention. They had to believe what they heard. Paul understood those Old Testament passages, and now he could preach Christ as the other apostles did from Genesis to Malachi. <clears throat> from those blessed scriptures, the apostles preached Christ. They preached Christ. They didn't have to bend and twist. They could now see in the scriptures what they were pointing to. The Holy Spirit was opening their minds and hearts with a holy fire of understanding. And they realized that the Old Testament was full of Christ. Augustine beautifully expresses it this way. Quote, The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. That's the Bible. In one sentence, he, he summed it up. I think that's astounding. The new is in the old concealed in other words full of Christ and the old is in the new revealed why do you see the apostles quoting the old testament over and over again especially uh, when you look at Galatians when you look at Romans when you look at Hebrews but it's far more than that the, the book of Revelation is filled it's like grand central station of old testament tracks running into it it's all fulfilled in Christ and his church. When we really begin to see that, then we have to lay aside the theology that says, ah, oh, well, the Old Testament, that's just law. I'll forget about that. So, <clears throat> we see what Augustine expresses very plainly in the Gospels in the book of Acts, in the apostolic writings. The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. <clears throat> so in verse 15, here in Galatians, Paul first illustrates his argument from the Galatians' familiarity with the common practice, the practice of human covenants. He argues, if a covenant is ratified, it cannot be canceled or changed. The Galatians would have understood that point. Some of us would go, uh, run that by me again, please. Because we don't covenant with one another, generally speaking. But it was something that was very often done among the Lord's people. Jonathan and David covenanted together. And later on, it's called God's covenant. When you agree with somebody about something, God takes it seriously, even when we don't. Many of us are going to have a lot to answer for. For things we'd say, sure, we do that. Yeah, we'll go along with that and then not do it. A lot of church members will have a lot to talk about with the Lord. 
yes, I agree to walk with this, and then never look at it again, and by that very uh, neglect, walk contrary to it on a regular basis. Same with the Bible. It's the same for all of us. So, Paul's made the argument. If a covenant is ratified, can't cancel it, can't change it. They got that. And he says, now, because I know you know that, I want to argue from the Abrahamic covenant and its relation to the Mosaic covenant. That's what he's going to do. He's going to show how the two work together. Paul says in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the word seed can be singular or plural. When it speaks of your seed, it could be speaking of your descendants, plural. Or it can mean one descendant. Paul <clears throat> looks at the passages regarding Abraham and says, he's talking about one seed. When you go and look at those passages, most of the time they're plural. How can he say it's one seed? Because the promise brings itself to a head in Jesus Christ. It's ultimately all about Jesus. Even though it's about a land, even though it's about kings, even though it is all the, the parts of the promise that make it what it is, it's one thing. It all comes down to Jesus. Amen. To Jesus the seed. He's the one who faithfully keeps all covenants. We're not too good at it. Thy seed, which is Christ. When you go back to Abraham, you see him very plainly with one son, right? And God demands of that one son, that only begotten son, that Abraham sacrifice him. There's the first Beautiful picture of Christ, the only begotten, being offered up. The Lord stopped Abraham before he took Isaac's life. But he took his own son's life. He took the life of the Lamb of God. He provided his own Lamb for all of us. <laughs> So let's look at the Abrahamic covenant for just a few minutes. Let's go back to Genesis 12. <clears throat> I'm going to read larger blocks of scripture than normal. And I'll be pointing out things along the way. But I want you to realize Paul knew these passages and they're in his thinking now from the view of Christ. And he understands them. <clears throat> so, this will help us, I trust. When next time we meet, we go deep, more deeply into what Paul says in Galatians. So, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> Now, the Lord had said unto Abram, verse 1 of chapter 12, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. The living God reveals himself to an idolater, a man from Ur of the Chaldees. It was a city that was given to a particular Female goddess. <clears throat> I suppose that's... Uh, could have said either one, right? A goddess or a female. <clears throat> I don't know any male goddesses. What do we have here? 
We have the God in his amazing and astounding grace following the crushing of the serpent's head. Do we not? We have him coming to a man that there were, by the way, let's, let's remember something. There was no Israel at this point. There was no land that they owned. There was no kingdom, no nation of Jews, no Hebrews, period. It was a world full of darkness, pagan, idolatrous, demonic idolatry. So this is an extraordinary thing. God reveals himself to a pagan. And he says, get thee out of thy country. Leave. And from thy kindred. How's this for family doctrine? And from thy father's house. Leave. <clears throat> Unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And I will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now look at verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram. There it is. Appeared unto him and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. What happened when God revealed himself, Abram worshipped. What happens when someone is genuinely converted? They will worship. We understand the difference between that and just going to a church or a building called a church. No, there's an immediate connection. And we want to know that God and we want to walk with that God and we want to obey that God. That's what Abraham did. That's what Hebrews is 11. Hebrews 11 is all about. Those who walked by faith. Abraham did exactly what God said. Walked out of his land. Walked out of his country. He didn't know where he was going. He was just going where God told him. What kind of faith did that man manifest? So, what do we see here? The first thing we actually see is a federal head. What? A federal head. A representative head. God makes all the promises to Abraham. He receives it, and he's representing all that are going to be his descendants. And they will get the blessing of their federal head head. Why is that important? Because you and I have no salvation whatsoever except for the federal head, Jesus Christ. God promised him many things. And as he walked on the face of the earth, he constantly said, my father sent me. I just do what he tells me to do. I do what he wants me to do. He said, I, I speak what he wants me to say, and I do what he wants me to do. He always hears me. Why is he important? Because he's our federal head. You cannot understand Romans chapter 5 if you do not understand the concept of a federal representative. You're either in Adam where you sit right now. That was your head. That was our head that fell in the garden. And you are either in that head. That's your representative and God's judgment on him is God's judgment on you and me. Or... You're in Christ, where God finished our judgment. Federal. People say, well, you know, I don't like those theological terms. You need to love that one. Because you don't have salvation unless you understand that you have a representative that acted in your place. That's what we have in a type. 
right here with, a- with Abraham. Abraham heard from God. Abraham covenanted with God. And then in that covenant, he promised him many things that ultimately will end up in our Savior, our federal head. Let's look at them. <clears throat> I will make of thee a great nation. In other words, right now, the nation that I have in mind does not exist. There are nations all over the world. There's one that doesn't exist, but it's about to, and it's going to be through you. This is an old man that has no children. Later on, he's going to laugh about this. But he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Well, that's exactly what Paul says in Galatians. We are blessed with faithful Abraham. What does that mean? We are blessed because he was a believer. He believed the living God. And if we believe like he believed, we will be converted as he was converted. We'll be blessed with and by Abraham. <clears throat> and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We've already seen that Paul sees the gospel in that language. Now, this is what we might call a transnational statement. <clears throat> in thee, who is going to be <laughs> a great nation, but you aren't yet, you don't even have children, in you will all the nations be blessed. The blessing of Abraham for all the nations is the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's just what he's saying in Galatians. Do we understand that that far back, God was revealing what we now take for granted? Abraham didn't say, wow, oh, this is all great. Where's the nearest Baptist church? He doesn't say that. He knows that God has dealt with him. He has believed this God's promises and his immortal soul has been saved. He probably wouldn't even have known exactly how to express this. But God spoke to him. There was gospel truth in it. He believed it and God justified him. Paul knew and understand, understood all of this. He understood this great covenant promise because in it here, you see something that is going to be a worldwide evangelistic program. God's. We see some other things promised here. In verse 7, it says, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Now, why is that important? Well, you don't have a nation unless you have somewhere to put them. Right? I mean, if, you, if you're going to have a seed, descendants, you've got to put them somewhere. If you're going to have a kingdom, you need a land. And that's exactly what God's doing. He is going to give physical promises, physical blessings to Abraham that later become spiritual truths that fill out our future. So unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar. In believing the living word, again, once again, it brought him to worship. Brethren, when we come, we need to believe the word of God as it is set before us. Amen. Believe it and walk with him. Worship him. Let's go to Genesis 15. <clears throat> after these things, beginning in verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. Now, are you noticing? God reveals himself 
and his purpose progressively. Every time the Lord starts talking to people, we learn more about our God. Read these things. Think about them. Don't just say, okay, well, God said something great. Move on. Uh, I read my chapter for the day. No. <laughs> what is it telling you about God? What is it telling you about ultimately your Savior, your salvation? The Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. <clears throat> and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. You made me a promise some years ago. And I don't have anything. How am I going to have a nation if I don't have any children? I have a, I have a slave here. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? No. Uh, the Lord says, uh -uh. Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. You were talking about a seed for me. No seed yet. Uh -uh. One born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. You're actually going to be a real-life father. And that son is what I'm promising you. And he brought him forth abroad. This is one of my favorite parts of the Scriptures. And he said, look now toward heaven. It's night, obviously. He takes him out, shows him an extraordinary starry night. He says, look toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. Tell there in that context means count them. Count the stars. Number the stars. And he said, so shall thy seed be. I'd like to do a series of sermons someday on... Finding yourself in the Bible. Do you realize you're one of those stars? I mean, that's... Hey, I'm there in the scriptures. That's right. This is the book about you as well as God and Christ. So we go out there and look. And, and of course, Abraham can't count all those stars. It's beyond our imagination how many stars are out there? The Lord says, if you can count them up, that's the way your seed is going to be. That means from generation to generation, God's not done. He's still gathering. He's still, Abraham would still be going, uh, two billion and three, <laughs> two billion and four. Notice, if thou be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Once again, here's the whole idea that Paul is arguing for in the epistle to the Galatians. It was said of Abraham, he believed the Lord. God said, look at all these stars. How is he going to have all those stars? Out of Abraham's nation will Christ come. The seed who will inherit all the promises. All the promises for the physical seed, I repeat, will become spiritual realities for God's people, for Christ and the church. You see, if Paul is really getting that, quite obviously he did, then he understands the incredible error that the Galatians are making. They're going back from the truth revealed, the glory of Abraham's promise and of his nation. They're going back to a physical promise and a physical nation when the whole thing has been about the holy nation of God's people. It's like people that are fixated today on, on physical Israel. They won't have the Messiah. They're not his people.
He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Justification by faith alone, right there. The doctrine of justification. And Paul argues that doctrine from this passage. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit. What's he saying? I'm going to give you real estate. You're going to have real estate. <clears throat> but you see, that's because your great nation is going to become a kingdom. The idea of covenant and kingdom are inseparable in the Bible. Covenant and kingdom. I've given you this land. But not because the land in and of itself is spiritual. But because what God does with Abraham and with his people pictures, symbolizes, typifies what's coming with Christ and his everlasting kingdom. Physically, Christ will come from Abraham. He will will be Abraham's seed. But the nation that Jesus makes is a spiritual kingdom. You're in it right now. If you're born again, you're in the kingdom that this typified. So, now again, Paul understands all these things. When you you understand that Paul sees this, then you realize better how he's arguing in Galatians and why he's arguing. How did you get that spirit, the spirit that fell on you? You didn't get it because you went back to Jewish law. You got it because you believed what I preached to you about Christ. And Christ was the fulfillment of the types and shadows in the Old Testament. He said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees. I saved you. I took you out of pagan darkness. I saved you to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against the other. But the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. What's he talking about? The book of Exodus. God's people are going to go down there because of an incredible sovereign work in a man named Joseph. Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. That means they're going to be slaves to them. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. They spoiled the Egyptians. And they went out with all the gold and silver and and jewels. And uh, carrying all kinds of things with them. Why did they do that? To build a tabernacle to the Lord. To worship the God who's making a promise to Abraham. You can't get the depths of this book without understanding its covenants. You must, (laughs) because they are the revelation of God and what he's going to do. You learn about your God from these appearances, from the visions. He's giving you a doctrine of God in those things. Look at him. Believe him. See how faithful he is from Genesis all the way to Revelation. 
His words never fail. And the covenants never failed. Never failed. You also see with each covenant more about what's coming. It increases. It expands our vision. First of all, it's a a serpent head crushing seed. That's it. But then it begins to grow. Now, it says, <clears throat> um, He said unto Abraham, Know of a surety thy seed. And it says, Also that nation I will judge. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they, your seed, your descendants, shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And he's talking about the land. They're going to be delivered. I'm going to deliver this great nation that I have promised you. And you're going to live in this land. It came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, Unto thy seed have I given this land. How many times has he said that? And he keeps saying it. Because it's the land for the kingdom that will eventually give us Jesus the Savior. No Abraham, no gospel. No land, no place for Jesus to be born. So, you say, now wait a minute, what was all this weird stuff about dividing up the animals and then this smoking, fiery thing going in between it? God is saying, remember we were talking about ratifying a covenant. When it's ratified, it can't be changed. God is ratifying with a practice that was well known in those days. It was this. Here are the bloody animals lying here. May that happen to me if I don't keep my promise. God is affirming to Abraham that the covenant promise is now ratified by God himself. That's why we're saved. He made a promise. He ratified it. It can't be changed. Can't be altered in any way or canceled. That's why Paul's making that argument. That is why Paul is arguing in Galatians. All right, here's the way it is with a regular covenant. So it is with God's covenants. And when, if just men say you can't cancel it, how about when God makes a promise, he keeps it? In other words, your salvation is sure and certain if you know Christ. Because God has committed himself not only to Abraham, but also to all of his people in Christ. Now, let's go to one more place and then we will call it an evening. Genesis 17. And when Abraham was 90 and nine years old, or 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Once again, we see this extraordinary revelation. God reveals himself to this, this pagan. Except he's not a pagan anymore. He's now the father of a nation that he doesn't have yet. But it's absolutely certain. God says, your seed is going to go down into that nation and I'm going to deliver them later. And here's my promise that it's going to happen. Because it Remember, that's what Abraham said. How am I going to know that this is true? The Lord has the animals laid out and that representative flame moves between them. Abraham got it right away. He knew that God was saying, may it happen to me if I were not to keep my word. That's the way they did many covenants back then. So, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. 
And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, God talked with this Chaldean, who is now one of his children. God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. He still doesn't have a child. God keeps telling him these extraordinary things. He still, still doesn't have a baby. Abraham fell on his face. Behold, my covenant is with thee, says God. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Have I made thee. Notice the verb tense. He doesn't say, I will make thee. It's already done. It's already done. I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Have you heard of First and Second Samuel? First and Second Kings? First and Second Chronicles? This is just an outline of the scriptures. This is what's coming. And we have the scriptures that show this is exactly what God did. And he says, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land. The land. Oh, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art stranger, all the land of Canaan. Now that takes you back to earlier in Genesis, to the whole issue of Noah and his descendants. And Canaan was a troubled child. And so was his land. The Lord is going to empty it of some of Noah's descendants. He's going to fill it up with Abraham's. I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for, ever, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. That's the language of covenant. I will be their God. They shall be my people. God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me, you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. This is where it appears. Every man child circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token, a sign of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh. Listen to these words. For an everlasting covenant. Now, what's one of the biggest problems that Paul has to work with in Galatians? Circumcision. This is why the Jews still believed this. It says everlasting covenant, does it not? The everlasting covenant means as long as something lasts. If they're not faithful to his covenant, he will cut them off. And that's exactly what it says here. It says, if you're not circumcised, then you will be cut off. If this skin is not removed, you will be removed from my people. They were unfaithful. They often didn't keep the covenant. Watch their history. These things are vital. But when they got a hold of themselves, especially after the 70 years of captivity, they began to hold on to circumcision as the sign of being God's 
people. Paul is going to say, it's not the sign anymore. And it's not the sign of God's people. That's one of the reasons the Jews hated him. They said, he's getting rid of Moses. He's getting rid of Abraham. No, he understood that Abraham was saved by faith. He was saved by faith. Where does God give Abraham circumcision as the sign? Right here. But long after he believed. And this is exactly what Paul argues in Romans chapter 4. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Abraham, when he was uncircumcised, was a believer. And he was justified before God. Now... We could go further, but we'll bring it to an end for this evening. Let's go back to Galatians. <clears throat> the Mosaic Covenant is, and I will say these few things as we end. The Mosaic Covenant is an expansion of the Abrahamic Covenant. Same people. Same sign, circumcision. Same land, Canaan. Same promises and promises of a king. And they have plenty of kings. There is an unfolding of God's eternal purpose before us. Very often we just get lost, you know, in the details of Leviticus. Where we need to realize all of this starts in Genesis 3.15 and unfolds with every single covenant revelation God gives. Because it all ends in Christ. That's why Matthew is so important. The generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, which we've mentioned before. So, Paul says, with great zeal... Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. All of Abraham's children are in Christ because they're all saved like Abraham was by faith. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. The Mosaic Covenant was an expansion of what was founded in the Abrahamic Covenant. And then there was another covenant after that, a covenant with David. Messiah was going to be David's son. Abraham, Israel, David's tribe, David's son. We'll stop there. But we close with the notion that there was one more covenant, the new covenant, in which all the things promised in the covenants ultimately come to fruition in Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So Paul knows that the Galatians are going backwards. He's saying, wait a minute, you have misunderstood you're listening to these Jews who are trying to make you Jews in order to be good believers and Christians. And that's a false gospel. It's finished. May God help us to see these things with greater clarity. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank thee for thy grace. <clears throat> thy scriptures take many paths but Lord if we follow the seed we begin to see how it all all is surrounding the Lord Jesus Christ making way for something that's only typified in the Old Testament and comes to reality in a manger we pray O righteous father that thy son will be exalted as we consider these passages 
And I ask, O oh Lord, that the name of Christ and what he has done will lift our hearts with joy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you'll stand with me. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May God bless you till we meet again. Let's go in the name of Christ. <clears throat>